Session 34 of the Law of One, part one, we're gonna get into karma and some more information about Catalyst. Let's begin. In the last session, we talked a lot about Catalyst in programming, and some of the questions that we have here are directly related to the questions that Don had, and you'll see when we get there, it's gonna make sense which questions they were, and Don is just gonna go a little bit deeper into those. And then Karma has a lot of information for us who have some concepts about what Karma is in Oriental philosophy, and you know how to apply the practical aspect of it i would say you know it's it's pretty good in this uh this session so we're gonna get into all of that the first question that was asked in this session was i didn't include it as usual in the slideshows because it's um it's not really related but it had to do with carla and now that she's, she was beginning to exercise don wanted to know or carla wanted to know also if she could do um, if it would be more beneficial to do two exercises before the session or something to that effect. And uh, Ra suggested that she would do one long session of an hour, I believe it was, and then one shorter session, half, so another half hour in the evening. And that was it. That was just the first question. There's another question that I'm going to obviate, I think is the 34.3, where Don also asks something personal about his own experience. And Ra actually says that they don't want to answer that um, uh, too much, but only comment that he should figure it out for himself because that would be infringing upon his free will. So those two questions that they include here, they are part of book five if you have the original books and they are part of this session if you, are, if you have the Ra contact books or if you have um, the... Um, the, the website of Law of One Info, which again, you can see in the description here below, and you were not reading the original, but the re-listen version or the raw contact, then you would see those questions there. They're part of book five again, the personal material that they excluded from the original books. So I didn't include it here. Sometimes I do because they have some relevance, like sometimes they would talk about synchronicities or they would talk about wonders or uh, something else. So I included them, but these two, I just didn't think it was necessary. So we're going to jump into session uh, 34, of course, question two right away. When Don is asking, first question that I have for this video. And after Ra answering the question about Carla uh, doing her exercises, Don says, thank you very much. We'll start general questioning now. You stated at an earlier time that penetration of the eighth level or intelligent infinity level allows a mind body spirit complex to the harvested to be harvested if it wishes at any time space during the cycle. When this penetration of the eighth level occurs, what does the entity who penetrates this level experience? Can you tell me this? It's a really good question. Ra says the experience of each entity is unique in perception of intelligent infinity. Perceptions range from a limitless joy to a strong dedication to service to others while in the incarnated state. The entity which reaches intelligent infinity most often will perceive this experience as one of unspeakable profundity. However, it is not usual for the entity to immediately desire the, ces the cessation of the incarnation. Rather, the desire to communicate or use this experience to aid others in ex is extremely strong. So the question that Don asked was, when somebody penetrates the eighth level of consciousness um, and they uh, they become harvestable, say because of their they are the, their activation of of their energy centers, then you know what's the experience? What does the person experience? It's a really good question, you know, uh, because it's. Um, it's a state that this is um, what I would call um, it's the state of awakening, Satori, uh, Bodhi, uh, whichever way you want to call it, you know, in different cultures and philosophies, 
But it is that state which, you know, the mystical experience that is hard to describe. And um, we can see the parallels already from what Ra is saying that when you reach this level, you have a, uh, a profound um, desire to communicate to others, you know, what happened to you. Um, and it's extreme joy as well. So uh, that's the question that Don was asking, like, what does this person experience once they do that? Now, I want to make a clarification before I go into uh, interpreting some of this stuff, because I think it's crucial, especially now it's crucial, especially because of the spiritual ego that comes out of this um, and our misconceptions of what awakening really is uh, in the sense of a sustained awakening. Um, Don is asking in terms of, say, uh, he said, you stated at an earlier time, this is something that they talked about before, I forgot which session they said this, but it was previously, of course, that penetration of the eighth level or intelligent infinity allows a mind body spirit complex to be harvested. This is to me, and this is interpretation for myself of the natural state of the being that accomplishes this penetration of eighth, uh, the eighth level by, um, by conscious work, by being that person, by embodying the experience that, it, that it's having and everything that is assimilating in terms of not understanding or knowledge, but in, in wisdom, in total wisdom of who the person is. So awakening in the sense of the oriental philosophies, you know, uh, not the experience of, not the mystical experience. I will use the word mystical experience or even Satori, which is attained by uh, certain practices and, on, and understandings of reality. So I will use those to refer or make sort of like a, a simile, if you will. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of creates context, okay? But this is not what Ra is saying, not to me, not to my interpretation. So again, you know, if it resonates with you, great. If not, then reject it. Because they're saying the experience of each entity is unique in perception of intelligent infinity. It's true. Uh, perceptions range from a limitless joy to a strong dedication to service to others while in the incarnated, incarnated state. So the, uh, the simile that I want to make is when people either have a mystical experience and this I, you know, can happen to people while they are in meditation or in prayer, uh, they are, you know, at their temples and I've, you know, I've heard stories like firsthand stories of people telling me, you know, how these experiences were and they just can't explain it. They just say that it was like, they felt like everything was love, you know, and everything was beautiful and they just had a mystical experience. And as a result, they become just this humble uh, people that are amazed by what they felt because even though they can describe it, they cannot help but act the way they are now. And some of them, uh, they just pursue this as a lifestyle of, you know, they, they just realize internally that this is all there is, you know, this is an awakening for them. So uh, I'm, I do, I'm not saying that these people are harvested because they had or harvestable because they had the experience. I don't know if this is penetration of the eighth level as Don was asking in terms of what I believe is conscious work that you simply embody. Uh, but it is related to that. I mean, I, I can see the, the parallels here also. And this is where I have all the caveats. The psychedelic experience does promote this, but to me, and this is, you know, again, the, uh, the disclaimer that is not equal to be enlightened. That is not equal at all to, uh, be harvestable because you had an experience. If anything, it will be a window opening to you, to the people that have done this, uh, these experiences. If any of you have done it, you know that there is a window opening that is telling you, you know, this is reality. This is how it is. This is who you are. Um, and so, you know, it is the will and the, the task of the experiencer in this case to embody that. 
to follow that path and to really, uh, like I said, incarnate that beingness. So, you know, and it's the same experience, you know, and this is why I want to relate it. The experience is one of abundant joy. You feel super, uh, not happy, but it's just a harmony and peace and just everything is perfect, a perfection. And there is a huge desire to communicate this to others and to serve other people in this way. And this is why, you know, it's it's common and I felt it myself. You know, when you have the psychedelic experiences, you almost want to tell everybody, you know, like they, they should be doing this. They should really, you want to shake them up to say the reality that you're living is not the one, the true one. <laughs> you must see for yourself, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have, it's funny how once you get into this path, you you find these people and I guess you recognize them more. But uh, I, I remember meeting somebody who was, uh, who had a mystical experience and he was, a drinker, you know, a guy that goes to bars, and you know, this this uh, this classical, you know, male-oriented uh, fellow. And after this mystical experience, he he claims that he saw Jesus, and I mean, he was Christian, of course. And uh, mystical experiences are always, um, or psychedelic experiences are related to what your belief system is. You know, what you associate those divine things with. So this person had a mystical experience with Jesus, and he became devoted to this and he could not stop talking about this with anybody and even told me like because i was really open to the person he was talking to me i just found it you know fascinating at some point it was just overwhelming like how much you know he wanted to push jesus on you know in the rhetoric but uh, you can see that this is just a natural tendency that people have once they have a mystical experience and that's all they want to talk about so um, again, you know, that is the experience. I'm not saying that having the experience means that you're harvestable already. Like, you know, hey, everybody, go go on the line, you know, get your uh, psilocybin or your ayahuasca trip and, you know, <laughs> you got your ticket to heaven. That's not how it works. Not to me. So I don't want that to be confused, you know, with the harvestable nature of having and embodying this experience for the rest of your life and just seeing reality as it is. In any case, they keep saying, the entity which reaches intelligent infinity most often will perceive this experience as one of unspeakable profundity, like I said. However, it is not, un, uh, not, it's, it is not usual for the entity to immediately decide the, the cessation of the incarnation, of course. Um, now we can go to deeper levels on to say, the people that actually got harvested 25,000 years ago, 150 people or so, they decided to come back because that's how much they wanted to serve because they say, and Ra says, rather the desire to communicate or use this experience to aid others is extremely strong. Uh, people who have woken up like Eckhart Tolle um, or um, just the Buddha itself, uh, Gautama Siddhartha, you know, they, they wanted to just express this and, you know, help other people to you know, share this experience to communicate to others, you know, what this is, even though it's impossible, but you want to be, make your best, you know, for this, you have to experience it yourself. So that is the experience. That's, you know, what people uh, have. And again, you know, not to be confused with the, the window, the opening of a window, you know, with the psychedelic experience, which again, you know, it may sound like I'm going against, you know, uh, the experience itself, but not to be uh, confused with enlightenment or something to that effect so anyhow we'll move to the next question and it's Don asking thank you would you define karma here we go so Ra says our understanding of karma is that which may be called inertia those actions which are put into motion will continue using the ways of balancing until such time as the controlling or higher principle, which you may liken unto your breaking or stopping, is invoked. This stoppage of the inertia of action may be called forgiveness. These two concepts are inseparable. So let's get ready for this journey. Karma. All right. So we have karma as something. Karma means action, your action, your doing. Okay. Our cultural or pop culture uh, understanding of karma is that uh, whatever you do is going to come back to you. That is true. 
but that's not karma um, defined completely. Um, I love that Ra says, because again, you know, Ra has like a very scientific, I'll use the word, it's a poor word, but they're very uh, academic, they're very sophisticated in the way they speak, and they use the word inertia. Inertia means the potential of movement that an object has, of course, you know, whether it be at rest or in motion, and it remains with that potential. So karma is a, an action that creates an energy that will remain in motion until it is stopped. Or, like they say, those actions which are put into motion will continue. It's almost like, you know, the, the classic uh, rock in space that is just traveling at a certain speed. You know, that's inertia. It has an inertia. Uh, will continue using the ways of balancing until such time as the controlling or higher principle, which you may liken onto breaking or stopping, is invoked. That is forgiveness. Forgiveness is what stops the inertia of that action. Now, um, and you can see why, you know, in, in pop culture, we have karma always as negative. You know, you have so much karma, you know, you, you're paying for your karma. That is all, you know, uh, perceived as negative. You have some negative stuff that you're paying off or you're paying because, you know, you're suffering and all this stuff. Sure, uh, I'll get into the, 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 percep the general perception that I see of this and also, um, you know, what it really is. Perception is key here. This is why forgiveness is the way we stop it. Um, but let's see into the mechanistics of, uh, or the mechanics of karma. Again, they mentioned the word inertia. So you commit an action that will create uh, an inertia. And that will continue to be, you know, uh, going until it stops. Um, so the way they understanding, uh, they understand that Ra said, you know, is this way, is something that has been put in motion and will continue to be in motion until it's stopped. And the way you stop is forgiveness. So this creates the cyclical experiences. This is why when we get invested in third density, you know, and speaking of wanderers, and when wanderers get invested in third density, then, you know, there is this, um, this possibility, this risk of getting karmically involved because you will create actions that you will deny that you did. And the denial comes from saying, I am a victim. Um, I am suffering this because you did it to me. And we fail to perceive that whatever we feel is something that we have created ourselves. Whatever we experience is that which we have created for ourselves. So the law of responsibility comes into play enormously here because you have to take responsibility for everything that's happening in your life. Otherwise, you're maintaining the inertia of karma until you forgive it. And I'll get to that. So um, this, this karma is moving, right? And um, we'll get into the, the, the forgiveness in a little bit. But I want to say that we only perceive negative karma because that's the one that's uh, destabilizing. That is the one that uh, continues to go, right? And we, uh, we see it as a, as a cycle of lessons that we must f uh, face. And until we forgive them, which again, we'll get to, uh, it's gonna keep coming. However, karma also works. And again, you know, they're using the word karma as we understand it, but karma as an action that you produce is also positive because when you love others and when you, and I'll just use the, the word love, when you do things to others, they'll come back to you. Only that we rarely perceive that which comes in and we accept it. We say, oh, you know what? I receive it. Then we come, we come full circle with the experience. Um, so this is also karma. It's, you know, putting out what you want to do, you know, of course, it can be done, you know, the, the idea, like the intention of, <laughs> I'm gonna do this, you know, I'm gonna donate all this money so I can get it back, you know, it doesn't work that way. It works, you know, uh, unconditionally. 
you just do it. You just do it because you just want it. I, I mean, it just happens. It happens, and that's how it is. And this opens a different door. And the door is that when you are doing it from a from the heart, which doesn't have an identity. Again, you know, you are opening. You're opening the perception that there is no self. There is no me. There's only other selves and the one self, which I am a manifestation of. So when I produce actions that are creating this positive karma, which I'll call positive karma for lack of a better term, uh, but we produce this inertia, we are not doing it to perceive it ourselves because we already perceive the self as everything. So um, there is no need and you have a detachment of what you do. This is another perception which really goes into the um, uh, the deepest portion of the self where uh, you, you you just don't identify with anything. You do things because that's you know how how you work. That's how you act. That's how you are. Uh, and so feeding the love, which is the only thing we have to give or take from uh, energy in the negative path, uh, but in the positive, all we're doing is radiating, you know, and that radiation is being uh, uh, absorbed by others, which in essence is you. And since you already have this belief and understanding that everybody is you, then whatever you do to others, you're doing to yourself. You don't have to feel it, you know, um, you know, you may feel it, but it, there's such a difference, you know, in terms of the, let's call it inertia of action, when it is uh, negatively oriented or when it's positively oriented and that's what we want to foster you know that's what we want to create that's how you create spiritual mass you know in terms of densities of consciousness and how you contribute to the universe you are a manifestation of the one self and the one self only wants to love itself so you know it's a it's a more much more efficient way to uh, spread the love you know <laughs> see how sophisticated i'm saying you know the same hippie you know, a message of, you know, love everything. <laughs> that's it. I mean, there's no other way. So, you know, I, I think that's that. So with all that in mind, forgiveness is a process of understanding, accepting, and then forgiving. Understanding is understanding that whatever, um, or knowing, not understanding, but knowing that anything that happened is you know um a result of other motions that were at play at the moment so you don't take you know responsibility in the sense that you are the victim or you are you know the culprit of whatever it is you simply acknowledge that you know it is what it is you know um so if it's something that you did then you understand that you take no ownership of that. You know, it's, it's not, it's, I know this sounds, you know, contradictory because of our, our culture indoctrination, but uh, you, you don't want to own that. I mean, it happened. It's fine. You learn from it. You experience it and you, you act accordingly, you know, in the future or at the present. The future never comes, but, you know, at present, you're, you always have that, you know, present. It's a lesson. You know, it's like when you start walking, you know, when you learn how to walk, you don't remember, you're not remembering how you walked and you take ownership for all the steps you did. You just walk. And in the same way, you know, you understand that. You understand that whatever happened, happened. And now, you know, from the perspective of you performing an action, that's forgiveness. Of course, you know, if you can do something to alleviate, you know, the pain that you caused to somebody else, that's fine, you know, but it all starts with the self. And then when somebody has hurt you or harm you, I mean, we can go on for a while on this because this is a very beautiful mechanic of, you know, how to create forgiveness. But when that happens, you don't uh, accept it as, you know, something that you are the victim of. Uh, rather, you can see it as you absorbing that, uh, that anger, that frustration, whatever it was that it caused that you know, that harm that they did to you and you don't own it either because it's not meant for you. It was meant for anybody. You know, you might have been the chosen one <laughs> to receive this 
And that's where the honor comes from serving the self, serving others. I'll give you an example. You know, I got uh, I got somebody really upset with me because I wasn't wearing my mask, you know, and God forbid you do something wrong in society. And, you know, he 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 was just full of anger and he uh, he told me, you know, to step away from him, you know, six feet away from not wearing my mask or whatever. And, you know, I did what he told me because I, you know, I, I, I realized what was, you know, his anger about. And, um, you know, it, of course, the human me during that day, you know, consequent days, I thought about like, why, you know, why do people have this anger? And my understanding came to that, you know, they have been uh, suppressed and repressed so much that they don't know what to do with this, you know, so they just spill it over to other people. So instead of me arguing back or, you know, whatever, just causing, like, bouncing the ball that he threw at me, I just simply accepted it and I said, you know, that's fine, I'll take it, you know, because I am not, not going to keep it to myself. I, I simply said, you know, I understand it, fine, you know, um, I don't harbor it. So that is the type of mechanics that you can do and, you know, some are harder than others, but in any case, I'm going too, uh, too far here. Too long with this uh, with karma. You know, Twenty five minutes in. So, <laughs> uh, so that is forgiveness. The stoppage of the inertia uh, of action may be called forgiveness because that's that's the process. But you first need to understand, understand it fully. What happened? You know why that happened. Uh, second, accept it. Accept it as you know as it is. You have no ownership. You have no responsibility. Things simply are, and you're just here to observe. And with that higher understanding then you just you know forgive it because there's actually you know it's not the forgiving that comes out of the mouth but from the heart so all right we can go to the next question where don says if an entity develops what is called a karma in an incarnation is there then programming that sometimes occurs so that he will experience catalysts that will enable him to get to a point of forgiveness thereby alleviating the karma Ra says, this is in general correct. However, both self and any involved other self may at any time through the process of understanding, acceptance and forgiveness, ameliorate these patterns. This is true at any point in an incarnative pattern. Thus, one who has set in motion an action may forgive itself and never again make that error. This also breaks or stops what you call karma. So, um, there's there's a couple of things here that uh, I already explained or I talked about and um, one more thing that uh, I believe Ross says here that is it's it's important to keep in mind they say you know well first Don's question was if if I create karma in my life that you know I wasn't supposed to you know I hurt my grandma you know I robbed someone I did whatever you know I created karma negative karma, of course, and this is what we're interested in here. Would there be catalyst uh, program or available for me to alleviate that? And now Ra says, you know, this is in general correct, because if you don't address it, if you don't, um, if you don't think about it, if you don't go through the process of, you know, processing this, then catalyst will certainly come back because that is inertia. Inertia will come back to you as a boomerang. And um, in this case, and when I mean inertia, I mean karma as inertia. It'll come back to you. Um, but Ra says, however, meaning that you don't have to go through the process of uh, experiencing or waiting for that catalyst. Like you, It's not like, oh my God, I did that, so I'm just gonna have to wait you know, for something to happen to me. Somebody's gonna rot me or whatever. It's a very simplistic way of seeing the, um, the cycle of karma. But then again, you know, um, you don't have to wait for that because both the self and any other person involved at any time through the process of understanding, acceptance and forgiveness, which I explained already, can lessen basically these patterns. Um, you see, here is the powerful thing, and I'll use another example of mine. Currently, as the day of recording this, I am going through the process of still, this it's almost a year now, of forgiving somebody who, um, I want to use the word betrayed me and really backstabbed me in so many ways. Uh, went from, you know, being 
um, a f dear friend, almost like a sister, to, you know, doing stuff that I consider to be, you know, uh, really negative. And to be honest, you know, I would be lying if I say, you know, that I have completely forgiven the situation. And I'm going through that process still. And, you know, it's hard for me to understand. And, and because I cannot understand, I cannot accept it fully. So forgiveness hasn't come yet. Um, but because of the perception of the things that happen, I could say that that karma was not, I mean, I, I paid for it, <laughs> whatever it was, because I was the victim, the, the seemingly victim here. But that will create, say, karma for her. Uh, it seemed that way. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I don't understand it yet. Uh, but if I could create some forgiveness for that, which I'm really trying to, because it, I just know that it's affecting me. If I can forgive her, then that will cause an ameliorating or lessening of the patterns of karma that we were both involved with. And not only am I freeing myself, but I will free her from that. And you see, this is where, you know, the human mentality will come and say, well, I was the victim, you know, she should, you know, suffer for what she did because everything that she did was wrong. You know, she hurt me, she caused this pain, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, that is the human mentality. But if I were to just simply accept it and, you know, lessen those patterns, then I don't, I don't think she should suffer for that. Why should she, you know? If I can understand, and I do understand, that it had to do with the patterns of her racing and everything else that happened, um, then, you know, I can see that whatever she did was just a reflection of something that she's not. Because her higher self is not represented in the actions that she committed. So my understanding goes beyond that, at least I try. And I, I see that she's not. She, she can be, you know, anybody who acts in a demeaning way or in a, um, in a, in a very negative and manipulative way, it's not being themselves. So I understand that, you know, and, you know, it's still, it remains to be seen how I still accept it and forgive it. But that's the process that I'm going to. But that, that, that mechanism is there. All right. So they say this is true at any point in an incarnative pattern. Thus, one who has set in motion an action may forgive itself and never again make that error. Uh, this also breaks or stops what you call karma. That would have to be the person who created that karma or created that action. Uh, so, uh, even in my place where I feel like I didn't do anything and I was just, you know, the receiver of all of this, um, that's fine because I would see, you know, that whatever I created to, um, to make that scenario possible, then I forgive that. I don't feel bad for uh, giving her the comforts of my friendship and other means that uh, were provided just, you know, as a brother, I felt, <laughs> to give, you know, all this stuff. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm fine. You know, I, I, I understand that. It. it was a scenario that was placed for both two experienced catalysts. I accept my catalyst. I forgive anything. And whatever she does, you know, it's really out of my hands. So I just hope the best for that. So this also breaks or stops what you call karma. Um, and this probably works more if you feel like you're responsible for the actions that were uh, committed. So which you're, you always have a place, but you can kind of rearrange this, you know, in a practical way, hopefully. So, all right. Don says next, thank you. Can you give me examples of catalytic action to produce learning under each of the following headings from the last session we had? Can you give me an example of the self unmanifested producing learning catalyst? Okay, so before we get into this, Don in the last session asked a couple of questions about um, catalysts, the best catalysts that, are, that there exist is other selves, other people. Those are our mirrors, our reflections of ourselves. And so those are the best. But beyond that, there are others and uh, don't ask about those. Those are the unmanifested self, rumors of war, uh, and others that I forgot already, uh, societal self, that sort of thing. So uh, Don wants to ask now, you know, in terms of the uh, unmanifested self, I believe, yes. So he says, can you give me an example of the self unmanifested producing learning catalyst? So he wants an example of 
how this, uh, again, not dealing with other selves, but the unmanifested self being the, uh, the core self that we are, that which is beyond the self, the perceivable self, and it's uh, resting in time space, which is you know what's producing everything that is now. So it's like the deepest portions of the mind. So Don asked this question, and Ra says, we observed your interest in the catalyst of pain. This experience is most common among your entities. The pain may be of the physical complex. More often, it is of the mental and emotional complex. In some few cases, the pain is spiritual and complex nature. This creates a potential for learning. The lessons to be learned vary. Almost always, these lessons include patience, tolerance, and the ability for the light touch. Okay, so again, uh, Ra is answering in the terms of pain. Um, because Ron, Ron, I keep saying Ron, it's a combination of Don and Ra. Now the Don is gone. Now the Don is gone. It's not Ra or Don, it's Ron. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah. Uh, I love being a child. So, <laughs> so Ra says, there is catalyst of pain because Don was asking about, um, Pain, as uh, if it in, in the last session, he asked if I remember correctly, if pain fell under the category of unmanifest itself, and Ra says yes. So Ra is going to answer in terms of pain. So they say pain may be physical, right, the body, or mental and emotional, the mind, and in few cases the pain is spiritual. Now, pain as physical, we know it, <laughs> don't we know it? Uh, emotional and mental, of course, we know it as well. And in spiritual, um, I don't think I grasp fully what this may be. I can only relate it to the pain that a lot of wanderers feel for not feeling part of the planet, yet they feel kind of like, like this is the thing, they don't feel part of society, but they feel part of the planet. So there is a conflict there. That's spiritual pain to me because they know internally that there's something else, but they can't find it. They're still confused. They're going through the, this process. So spiritual pain may be this way. That's just my speculation. Um, this creates a potential for learning, of course, whether it be physical, mostly mental and emotional, which is what we're experiencing uh, all the time. The lessons to be learned vary, but they always produce patience, tolerance, and the ability for the light touch. That is the purpose of the lessons. Like the lessons were supposed to produce that. Um, and um, yeah, so when we have say physical pain, physical pain, the way I understand it is emotional pain that, I mean, disregarding of course, you know, uh, physical trauma, which is, you know, an accident, you break your bone or, you know, cut yourself. And even that could be a manifestation of some emotional stuff that's been going on. But let's let's just divide, make a, 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 a an invisible line here to separate the physical trauma to the emotional. The emotional, when it's not processed, and this is where illness and disease comes from, when it, it kind of um, creates this, the, this possibility of, of having, you know, illness, like cancer, for example, is an exacerbation of not being able to understand um, your your emotions, especially anger, you know, uh, and other discrepancies with the harmony that you are. Um, so, you know, it's a very emotional to physical type of manifestation. So physical manifestation, in this case of pain, it becomes it's, it's coming from the mind. The mind creates the body. But mostly what we are experiencing is, is emotional and, uh, and mental uh, pain, which is, you know, we're, we're familiar with it. You know, us, how we feel with ourselves, and with the external world, and who we are and what we are and so on and so forth. So this creates potential for learning always, you know, that emotional pain is always there to teach you something, you know, it's always there to show something about you and only you can discover that, you know. So that's what they're saying here. Let's move on to the next part of the answer. Ra says, very often the catalyst for emotional pain, whether it be the death of the physical complex of one other self, which is loved, uh, or some other seeming loss, will simply result in the opposite, in a bitterness and impatience and souring. 
This is Catalyst, which has gone awry. This, in these, in these cases, then, there will be additional catalysts provided to offer the unmanifested self further opportunities for discovering the self as all sufficient creator containing all that there is and full of joy. All right, so uh, very raw way to say that uh, very often emotional pain, uh, whether it be you know the death of a loved one or some other seeming loss. I love how they say seeming loss because nothing is lost. If we could grasp this concept and understanding and live it and embody it, we would be free from so much pain, knowing that there is no loss of anything. Everything is working in uh, in unity. Everything is working in in unison, actually, as a symphony. You know, there is no loss. Everything is presenting. You know, when the drums or the percussion stops, it's because it's allowing other parts of the orchestra to keep playing. The music continues, you know, and you're just playing your part here. Everybody's playing their part. They come back again, you know, and it creates a, it's an ongoing eternal music that's going on. We all play our parts. So the death of a loved one and um, the any, any other seeming loss could be anything, you know, like say my friend, you know, lost a friend. And to be fair, you know, talking about it, because I can't stop thinking about it. My pain comes from losing a friend. That is a trauma that I have that um, it's a, it comes from uh, self-worth, I know that, and losing a friend to me causes me pain. It used to cause me even more pain because I felt like without friends, I am nobody. So um, even up to last year, I was very susceptible to this. So I see how this is teaching me something. You see, there is, that is a loss. It's a seeming loss. I didn't lose her. You know, she's still there. You know, she's still for me in the sense of, you know, what she was. You may not talk anymore, you know, now in the physical, but she's not, she's not lost to me. Her higher self is still there. We planned this together. So in any case, without going too esoteric on this, you know, the seeming loss here is, uh, it's something that we perceive to be lost. Physical death is, you know, one that again, you know, it's a, it's a very seems very real, but it's not. Uh, so this results in bitterness, impatience, and souring. And this is catalyst because it's catalyst to us that has gone awry, meaning that has gone, you know, uh, the wrong way or uh, un unrelated to the direction that it was supposed to be. So. In these cases, there will be additional catalysts provided to the other to offer the unmanifested self further opportunities for discovering the self. So the unmanifested self is that which wants to manifest, okay? That which wants to, you know, say, you know, I have this fear, you know, of losing friends. And my unmanifested self is saying, listen, your perception of friends is not true. It's false. Friends is something that you have to realize in a better concept of reality for you. So if that's what my unmanifested self wants to show me, it will provide me the catalyst for me to realize that. So that's what they're talking about, that, you know, when it goes awry, then, you know, the other opportunities will be, you know, offered to discover the self as all sufficient creator, containing all that there is and full of joy. Meaning that in my example, I don't need friends to be, I am, and thus I have friends, you know, but if I don't, I still am. And that is the key thing. You are always, I love how they say it here, discovering the self, me, in my case, as all sufficient creator, containing all that there is and full of joy. I don't need anything to be joyful. I don't need anything that will make me uh, complete the seeking of that is the unrecognition that I am. I am everything. So, so much we can get into this, but uh, we have more to cover. We're getting close. I want to cover at least two, three more questions here. So Don says, do what we call contagious diseases play any part in this process with respect to the unmanifest itself? It's a really good question right now. Uh, and Ra says, 
These so-called contagious diseases are those entities of second density which offer an opportunity for this type of catalyst. If this catalyst is unneeded, then these second density creatures, as you would call them, do not have an effect. In each of these generalizations, you may please note that there are anomalies, so that we cannot speak to every circumstance, but only to the general run or way of things or way of things as you experience them. So we're talking about contagious disease and oh gods, if there was a time in humanity where this question was more relevant uh, in terms of you know what higher density uh, beings think about or know about this, it would be now. Probably last year a lot more, but with all the chaos, who knows. Um, so does these contagious disease uh, play a part. I believe that's what Don asked uh, with respect to the unmanifest itself. If the contagious disease and these, they they do play a role. I mean, uh, disease again. You know, it has been explained by other uh, entities in the Confederation that you know it offers an opportunity for growth, for um, for understanding the self, and for ameliorating some of the patterns that have been created already too. They are a type of catalyst, for sure. So uh, if the catalyst is not needed, then it won't be manifested. I mean, if you, um, this is the reason why, you know, um, and I mean, so much we can go into conspiracy theories and controversial topics here in terms of, you know, contagious disease, because now we know what's been going on and, and you know, there's, there's extreme views on this. Um, the point is that, Whatever the seas is out there, if you are receptive for that catalyst, you will get it. You know, whatever the seas it's going on on the planet, how it originates, it doesn't, it's not related to this. It's just how the person reacts to this. This is why a person who is, I don't want to say spiritual, but somebody who is just harmonious with, with itself, lives, you know, a, a pleasant life, doesn't have any problems or emotions, uh, emotional problems, then they tend to have a pretty healthy life. Whereas, you know, the other extreme is very, you know, ill and all this stuff. So our pursuit for health or for, you know, just uh, a healthy lifestyle probably is secondary, you know, to the way you feel and act in, in reality. You know, uh, like, you know, people who are surrounded by quartz and crystals and, you know, they eat a vegan diet and they, you know, they chant and they do meditation and yoga practice. And I mean, you can throw in all that stuff in there and people do it and they become this, you know, active, health, healthy uh, lifestyle people. But internally, they're full of, you know, emotional pain and problems and rejections and hatred and all this stuff. That, and they may even pretend that they are not. These people are going to be very susceptible to disease. I mean, they are creating either the disease themselves, as we know. Um, viruses are activated in the body. They're not uh, contagious in themselves. They are activated. We're full of viruses and they get activated as a part of our immune system. So if you create the environment for it, and obviously you have the virus, then it will be activated. You know, that's just how it works. It's not a contagious thing in terms of, you know, I will get it from you because you have it. Um, no, it, it doesn't happen that way. It has been proven for uh, probably over a hundred years when I think it was the Spanish flu or they did, they tried to literally inject people with the virus, um, the contagion, not even the virus, but just like, mucus and all their stuff i mean they were pretty nasty back then <laughs> they did it with horses and all this kind of stuff and they didn't get infected because their vibrational state was different than the other animal or the other person so it this is just to say that your internal environment is your best defense to anything um, we can see now how the orion group through the elite here has caused this uh, lower vibrational state of fear and anxiety, so people actually are susceptible to disease. That is just how it works. I mean, I'm not calling on any conspiracy theories, but I'm just talking about, you know, the the way how the Orion Group works. 
that's just what we know. You know, negativity works that way. It wants to create a fertile environment for people to be in a depressed, depressed state. So, uh, again, you know, it, I love that Ra also says they cover all they, their bases and they say in each of these generalizations, you may please know that there are anomalies. There are anomalies. So we cannot speak to every circumstance, but only to the general run or way of things, which can be, you know, truthfully, what we know in Europe uh, back in the medieval times where we had these huge cities and we we just had really poor hygiene. I mean, that's just unacceptable for a um, civilized society <laughs> where they were, you know, crapping and, you know, throwing... Uh, putrefied remains of animals into the same source of water they were drinking. I mean, yeah, that will brew the seas beyond catalyst. I mean, that's just you calling for these. I mean, you're brewing the disease there, so they're, they have to live somewhere, right? They're going to live in you. So, you know, to me, that those are anomalies as well as others, you know, how people get infected into some rare disease. You know, how do you get that? It seems contagious, but not everybody gets it, you know. Why is that happening? We don't know. So, anomalies on the side, contagious diseases are there for the people who are susceptible for it, and you are susceptible if you obviously have a fertile environment uh, energetically for it to, uh, to live in. So, health starts from inside, not from outside. Oh my God, what did I just say? Do it or don't do it. All right, <laughs> take it or don't take it. Next question. Um, Don says, what part do what we call birth defects play in this process? Ra says, this is a portion of the programming of the mind-body complex totality manifested in the mind-body-spirit of third density. These defects are planned as limitations which are part of the experience intended by the entity totality complex. This includes genetic predispositions, as you may call them. So, um, very quick here, very simple. Um, or was it that Don called it? I don't want to use a wrong term here. Uh, birth defects, which are congenital, uh, of course, um, genetic predispositions. This is all, again, part of um, the programming of, just like we have discussed that certain disease, like say, I don't know, I call asthma. I, I suffer from asthma, not you know in an emotional reactive way, thankfully, but in a viral way, whenever I get uh, sick with a cold since I was a, a baby, literally, um, I would have this, you know, constriction of my respiratory ways. And over time, as you know, I grew that just kind of went away, but it's still there. You know, that is a portion of my uh, my program. I, I've come to accept that. So that is a congenital to me, of course. These defects are planned as limitations, which are part of the experience intended by the entity totality complex. So when you see yourself, not from the little me, poor little me, but from the higher me that planned this incarnation, and it's just a brief experience, then you see that, you know, whatever you have is what you have, you know, and that's fine. You know, I planned this, so I must surely know up there or down there or inside, you know, whichever way you want to see it, uh, I must know what I'm doing. So I trust that. Um, I accept my asthma. That's it. It's there. Uh, my lower back pain, which is something that I'm sure it was catalyst for something else, but we need not get to that. Um, so, you know, all these uh, uh, defects, we're talking about birth, birth, birth disease or birth defects, uh, actually. So... That is a portion of the programming. It's there, you know. This is why I tell everybody uh, who, you know, and you know, it's, it's some, some some of them are hard. You know, some of them are hard to accept. You know, I used to train. Uh, I mean, when I say train, it's like powerlifting training. Somebody with uh, cerebral palsy, and uh, I mean, she was a lovely lady, and uh, you know, she she was she was accepting uh, of their of her disease. Um, but sometimes you would see that there was some weakness into, you know, I wish I was. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard to accept. But in the end, if that's what you have, that's what you have, you know. And uh, sure enough, she was very spiritual as well. So, you know, that helped a lot. Um, probably the best client I had for powerlifting. She was such a... <laughs> anyhow. Um, so, yeah, you know, uh, all these diseases are genetical and 
they're just there as long as you have a perception that goes beyond this physical you know limited body then you'll have you know a better perception of yourself all right uh i want to get at least into this one before we close this video for today don says thank you would you give me the same type of information about the self in relation to the societal self this is another question that comes from session 33 so um catalyst catalyst from the self in relation to societal self Ross says, the unmanifested self may find its lessons, those which develop any of the energy influx centers of the mind-body-spirit complex. The societal and self interactions most often concentrate upon the second and third energy centers. Thus, those most active in attempting to remake or alter the society are those working from feelings of being correct personally or of having answers which will put power in a more correct configuration. This may be seen to be a full travel from negative to positive in orientation. Either it will activate these energy ray centers. Let's make a pause here um, and refresh that in the last session, again, we talked about uh, the unmanifest itself, that catalyst is there, and then there is the, um, the relation of self with the societal self, meaning this self that has recognized self-aware, uh, of itself and then how do I belong to society so how does the catalyst present there and Ra says you know um, this the unmanifested self again the one that wants to show here uh, finds its lessons catalyst in um, those which develop in any uh, of the energy influx centers of the mind body spirit complex meaning that you will find those lessons the unmanifested self you know um, may find its lessons which develop an energy influx center so in any chakra of your body you may experience this okay it's not limited to just one the societal and self interactions most often concentrate upon the second and third energy centers so the relation of self to the society to the culture to the tribe to your sense of belonging in the group other selves are um, mostly with the second and third energy center so uh, orange ray uh, energy center and yellow ray energy center so those most active in attempting to remake or alter the society are those um, working from feelings of being correct personally so those who are working again um, how you feel in society you know can create uh, a catalyst for every other energy center because once you are at that point you are self-aware. This is why it's key. You know, the work that we're doing here in third density is key because you can actually uh, create catalyst by having the self-awareness for all other energy centers. And it's worked in within the societal self because other people, right, they're here. Uh, I don't wanna go so deep into this, but I want you to reflect on the fact that in third density, Catalyst and speaking of catalyst, this is something that Ra says in other sessions is a hundred times more powerful uh, for lack of a better term More intense. I think it's the word that they use a hundred times more intense than in any other density Which means that the catalyst provided here in society culture other people groups tribe, whatever um, It's a lot more potent for us than in other uh, density. So uh, we can use this for any other part of our energy centers, you know, love, wisdom, uh, unity, uh, sacredness of everything. You can see this here, it's so powerful. So again, that's what they're saying there. And then they say, you know, the societal and self interactions most often concentrate upon the second and third energy centers, meaning, you know, those two energy centers that are related to my self as identity, and myself as part of a group. And they say those most active in attempting to remake or alter the society are those working from feelings of being correct personally. So those who feel that they are correct because, uh, you know, their, um, I don't know, their perceptions of life and how they think, um, they, they feel that they're correct. You know, the type of people that I'm talking about. I mean, I have been there, so I know what that feels. Obviously, I've worked most of my life from trying to feel correct personally. I'm just opening now, you know, for those who don't know. I'm recent here, so I haven't been doing this for too long. Um, 
And they say, or of having answers which will put power in a more correct configuration, which means, you know, political, obviously. You know, how you rearrange, you know, uh, society and what's best and whatnot. I mean, we're talking about political, not with the Orion group's influence, even though it may be. Uh, but and that's why they say this may be seen to be a full travel from negative to positive in orientation. Either will activate these energy ray centers because these are the orange and yellow ray energy centers. That is, you know, how we, we activate them. Um, in relation to other selves, how we put power in configuration. Now they're going to say something else, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll put you know an end to the, uh, to this first part. Or they say um, there are few whose desires to aid society are of a green ray nature or above. These entities, however, are few due to the understanding. Uh, may we say a fourth ray that universal love freely given is more to be desired than principalities or even the rearrangement of peoples or political structures. So, beautiful. Now, there are some whose desire, which is hard, you know, green ray uh, nature, um, they they have desires to a society, not in uh, correcting the power or people and rearranging them and all this stuff. This, this third uh, density mentality that we can create the perfect society, the utopia that we never achieve, uh, that is because third density is not meant for that. Third density is to decide what to do. I mean, it is a way, and that is, you know, a way of service for sure. Um, the Egyptians did it terribly. <laughs> we are doing terribly now too. Uh, but that's because of Orion. Yeah, let's blame them. Let's put the the blame on them. <laughs> uh, so in any case, um, these entities. I'm talking about Green Ray now. People who are loving. They're more into the understanding that Ford Ray is universal love, freely given. It's more desire than principality. So uh, we are not too concerned with creating the perfect society. Like we don't think we should create, you know, the, the blueprint for everybody to live. Rather, you know, that the, 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 um, uh, the foundation of it is, you know, love. Whatever you want to do with your group, your tribe, your society, your civilization, your new world order, <laughs> doesn't matter as long as it's loving. You know, if it's loving, then who cares? You know, it's fine. That is what we're really, you know, uh, all about here on planet Earth, at least in third density. So uh, we're more than that than principalities or even the rearrangement of peoples and political structures. So we know that a rearrangement, rearranging the pieces is not going to cause anything different than what it is but rather, you know, that the pieces work harmoniously together. And, you know, that's no matter how you, you put it together, as long as it's harmonious, that's fine. You know, it's, that's just all we're looking for. So that is, those are the catalysts that are provided here, say in the, in the scheme that we have in third density, that is the catalyst that is available because we're trying to live with each other basically how how do we live with each other that's the question in essence you know and uh, that is the catalyst catalyst is provided by how we think we should live and you know there are those who think very orange and yellow ray very sensitive to orion group influence and negative path and there are those who think in uh green and blue or even indigo you know of rearranging society if we could rearrange society at least in the green we would be so uh so much more harmonious you know like much less chaos of course and all these conflicts we would transcend i'm not gonna say better it's going to uh, higher consciousness of course blue and indigo would be the utopia <laughs> but that is you know beyond that this is the the uh, the terrain that we have the the landscape in which we have catalysts for those. So with that, we're gonna leave it at this. Um, we have um, some of the questions that we're gonna cover. It has to do with catalyst and how it's provided here. We're gonna talk about uh, other people like Martin Luther King, and I forget, Albert Schweitzer. I forgot, I always butcher his name. But um, uh, yeah, so we're going to, um, to get into that in the next video. So uh, conclusions. We talked about karma and we talk about catalyst again. So how I want to wrap this up is to remember that karma is mostly seen in the negative because of the things that are happening to us are just, you know, reflective of what we have done in the past. It could be from other incarnations. And that's why we shouldn't even 
really care about what we did in other incarnations because it's happening here. We don't imagine if we would we would know everything we did in other incarnations. Then we have this anxiety, you know, of if it's gonna happen to me, how is it gonna happen? Now I gotta feel it, you know, it's gonna happen. No need. And um, you know, in some cases, regressions may be helpful. Uh, I don't believe it's it's necessary for sure. Uh, so all you need to do is pay attention to the present moment. What's the present moment giving you? You know, how can you react to that in a loving way? How can you uh, forgive anything that you feel that is, you know, I don't know, say somebody just, uh, I don't know, their dog craps on my lawn. Do I care? Do I even need to forgive them? I don't care. I just see like some sort of, you know, uh, uh, fertilizer for my lawn. Not that I care much about my lawn anyway, so... Um, so, you know, to me, that's not much. But if somebody comes, you know, here and insults me and, I don't know, comes here and beats my son for some reason, I mean, then I have strong catalysts to work with. You know, how do I how do I forgive this person? What is it teaching me, you know? Uh, so it's always to work with what you have here without getting too involved in karma. Karma can create a lot of anxiety, you know, for people because once they get in the known of this, they say, oh my God, how much do I have to pay for this life? Uh, you don't, you don't know, and it's better not to know. What you have to uh, kind of nourish is that mentality, that consciousness that sees everything as one, everything as love, and everything that is being presented here as an illusion of what really is, and all you need to do is absorb it with you know your heart. I know it sounds simple, but that's just how it's supposed to be. And that's it, you know, you, um, catalyst will come, you know, for you to, um, to either manifest yourself as you are, manifest more of yourself as you are, uh, or, you know, provide that opportunity for you to alleviate karma. So that's the way, you know, we should be going about our life, uh, I believe, if we, if our path is to l feel liberation, remember, uh, liberation from karma all together and feeling that you obviously don't have and this is probably the best uh, perception that I can give you for this is that when you realize that you have no self Anatman as they say in Hinduism there is no such thing as me okay there is only consciousness and I am a simple singular observer of consciousness here then you don't associate with anything. Karma is completely banished from your perception because nothing that happens is happening to you, is happening around you, you know, and you don't even consider your body part of, you know, you because you are everything. So you're seeing the creation as a whole. And, you know, if you can, again, foster this type of mentality, then you would be uh, equipped with a better uh, understanding of reality that allows you to not even process karma, but just, um, you don't even have to actively forgive it, anything. You just accept it as, okay, you know, just happen, just something that happened. You know, I don't need to get involved. There's no me to be involved with. So, you know, it's just, it helps a lot, you know, to have this, this, this notion of reality. We're not there yet, you may not be, or maybe we are, who knows, depends on you but it, it really gets to that point. So uh, that's the highest point of perception that we can have. That is what we should seek in meditation or we are trying to seek actually. Meditation is that, you know, it's the solution of the concepts and ideas that we have of ourselves that's creating the mind and the eternal reflection of the ego. So that's all I got for the first part of session 34. In the next part, again, we're just gonna finish session 34. We're gonna talk more about uh, Catalyst, I believe, and these characters of history. Thank you so much for watching. Again, I hope this was helpful and was um, helpful in a way for understand, understanding karma and um, Catalyst and programming and the self and everything else. So again, thank you so much. I'll see you in session 34, part two.